This Week Conversations on Healthcare welcomes Harvard epidemiologist Dr. Michael Minna on the need to deploy rapid COVID tests for all Americans to bring the pandemic to an end. Now, here's Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. We're speaking today with Dr. Michael Minna, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology, Immunology, and Pathology at the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School. He's a member of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at Harvard and lead researcher at the Human Immunomics Initiative. Dr. Minna has been advocating since early in the pandemic for the deployment of a rapid testing infrastructure as a public health tool to quickly contain COVID outbreaks and get this pandemic under control. Dr. Minna, welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. Well, thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here. You know, the CDC just issued a recommendation on the booster shots and causing some commotion. Uh, I would also say probably some confusion. Uh, their recommendation calls for booster shots for those that are 65 and older and uh, those 18 and older who are working at higher risk professions or institutions. And you said we should be less focused in on boosters and more focused in on the world's unvaccinated, of which there are billions, uh, suggesting that one shot uh, to an unvaccinated person is worth a thousand boosters uh, to the general population. I wonder if you could just tell us more about that. Also share your thoughts on the CDC's decision uh, on, the, on the boosters and the ongoing threat with so much of the world uh, still unvaccinated. Yeah, well, I, I, I think it's important to realize that I have the luxury, if you will, of, of being able to uh, discuss these things without actually having to deal with the practicality. And the practicality is that the CDC is in a position where they're focused on the United States. Uh, I'm in a position where I uh, rightly get to focus on on what's happening around the world uh, from a more ethical perspective. And this is really a tension, I would say, uh, when you have a government that has uh, their primary uh, operating sort of principle is towards one country, but we're in a global pandemic. How do you balance those things? And I would say that arguably we have not figured out how to balance them. And in this pandemic, certainly, uh, global aid is domestic uh, defense. You know, the, the more we can limit spread and limit the virus across the world, the better we're going to be in the long run. But it's very hard to make that uh, assessment in real time uh, in a principled way without running into a lot of political um, issues. And so what I meant by that comment is uh, one unvaccinated person who's, let's say, 65 years old in a country where there are a lot of cases right now, but not a lot of vaccines, giving that one vaccinate, unvaccinated person a vaccine is likely to, to, to match the benefit that that person would have in a nearly fully vaccinated community. Giving so It would take thousands of booster doses. We just have to look at the infection fatality rate or giving it to a 12-year-old, for example. Uh, you'd have to vaccinate thousands and thousands and thousands of 12-year-olds to, uh, to have the same benefit in terms of mortality protection uh, in a 65-year-old who's totally unvaccinated. So these are really ethical, global ethical issues that are extraordinarily difficult uh, to manage uh, without having a, an overarching uh, equilibrating body that is able to allocate vaccines uh, appropriately across the globe. And unfortunately in this state and this, uh, or this time, uh, the wealthy, continue to do what the wealthy do, which is um, gain access first and continue to protect, uh, even if it is unfortunately at the expense indirectly of protecting other much more vulnerable individuals. Well, Dr. Mena, you've uh, been a pretty clear voice since early uh, in the pandemic calling uh, for a broad deployment of rapid COVID testing for all Americans. And we didn't quite get there. And you've made the point uh, obviously, the vaccines are essential to bring us to immunity, but that rapid testing is the tool that maybe helps us end the pandemic without lockdowns or massive quarantines. And I, I think this has maybe a little bit been a little bit lost on the public, but as we hear about shortages of rapid tests and some of the uh, public health sites for testing not as readily available, I think it's a really important one to talk about. So maybe you could talk with our listeners a little bit about kind of the medical approach to testing using the more sensitive but the slower PCR tests with a more delayed uh, response time to rapid tests is maybe the better 
public health intervention and that that might help us going forward as well as in hindsight might have helped us more uh, to avoid getting quite to where we got today. Can you clarify that, elaborate on that a little bit for our listeners? Sure. So we early on in this pandemic, we focused on the PCR test in general, because that was it's a very easy thing to develop a PCR test. We need to know the sequence of the virus. And then within a day or so, we could have a, a well working PCR test. But the PCR test uh, at this point in the pandemic and frankly, a year ago uh, at this time, a year ago uh, as well, uh, it was pretty readily recognized that PCR is not the best approach if our goal is one of public health. And what I mean by that is uh, for public health, we're not interested in asking, uh, is this person's symptom uh, a headache or a, a stomach ache or, or whatever it might be uh, due to an infection that they had two weeks ago? Right. That's for a physician to answer. And a physician has the luxury of being able to deal with one person at a time and does not have to think about the 99.9999% of people that are not passing through their office. But in public health, that's not the goal. For public health, we have to think about the system. We have to think about how do we reduce transmission of this virus across the community? And to do that, a rapid test is what we need because a rapid test will define, will indicate if you are currently infectious. And they're extremely accurate for doing that. If you're infectious with this virus and a risk for spreading the virus to other people, then these simple rapid tests are going to turn positive. There's been so much confusion about, is it less accurate or more accurate? Right. And in many ways, it is actually the more accurate test for that specific question. And what happened early in this pandemic is we we medicalized the, the approach. A lot, of the, a lot of last year, I was talking about how it felt like our, our approach to tackling this pandemic, this global health emergency, was trying to tackle it at, a, at an individual medical basis, one person at a time. And you will never claw back a pandemic one person at a time. You have to deal with the pandemic and then the medical issues resolve themselves if you stop the spread. So these tools are extremely accurate for that question. But what happened was we started regulating these tools as medical devices which put the FDA actually in an impossible position of trying to say, okay, we need to take a test that is highly accurate to ask if you are infectious and compare it to a PCR test that's highly accurate to ask, do you have any remnants of viral RNA in you, even if you were infectious four weeks mm -hmm. ago? So they're very, very different things. And I like to liken it to uh, a security uh, system at an airport. PCR, the way that we're doing it now, is a bit like having 1% of all people who are getting who are going through the, the into an airport, we're only shuttling 1% of them through the security screens, and we're giving them an incredibly robust security screen. Meanwhile, 99% of the people are just not getting screened at all. And we're looking at those 1%, we're saying, man, they're getting treated very well, they're they getting a very good screen, but the 99% uh -huh. of the other people are just walking straight onto the plane. And this is the difference. What we found obviously years ago with, with airport screening is we can't do that. We actually have to have 100% of the people walking right. through metal detectors, even if they're not the most uh, sensitive to detect the very last little shard of metal you might have in you. They are doing the exact job that we need them to do, which is identify weapons or whatever it might be amongst the most number of people as possible. And that's what rapid tests are extremely uh, good at doing. You know, I want to go back to your first statement about the lens that you're looking uh, at the p pandemic from. And I, I think it's it's the right lens uh, to be looking at it. And uh, it's about the long term best interest for our country to take this uh, uh, approach that it's a it's a global pandemic and we need to solve it uh, not only uh, within our shores, but, uh, but across the globe. You know, I, it seems that uh, President Biden's gotten religion about uh, uh, scaling up uh, the production of rapid tests and really trying to drive that price point down. Uh, he's planning to deploy them. I know we're going to receive them here at community health centers, but also safety net providers across the country, really making sure the underserved population, not just the rich, are able to have access to it. But we again have seen the FDA and the CDC uh, slow to approve some of these tests 
Uh, the CDC does not have a good record on, on uh, uh, the whole issue around uh, rapid test. Uh, and there are some real concerns about the lack of supply. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us about the hurdles that remain and whether the current administration's efforts are going far enough. Well, at the moment, they are not going far enough. Um, but I do believe uh, that they are trying. Um, the president's uh, COVID-19 action plan that he announced the other day was, I think, a massive step in the right direction. Um, you know, what happens with these types of plans is he comes out and says, we're going to get 280 million tests out to Americans. That's that's a, a pretty mediocre number of tests when you have a country of 330 million. For, for the average person, it sounds like a lot of tests. 280 million sounds like a big number, but that's less than one test per person. And when we need tests to help us in our everyday lives. We need more than one test per person per year. Um, but but what, what it was was a recognition that these tests are extremely important to our overall uh, efforts to battle this virus. I think where the administration has had difficulty is understanding actually what is the true bottleneck here in terms of Americans having access. They've been trying. When I spoke with the Trump administration and earlier, uh, during the transition with the Biden administration, you know, the, the, the response that I got quite often was, uh, Dr. Minna, this sounds like a, a great idea, uh, but frankly, we don't have any supply to actually make a robust uh, plan for the country. So that's kind of where the conversation always ended. Hmm. So what we can do is we can recognize, so why is the U.S. so behind our European counterparts to get these tests? It's not because the tests don't exist. It's not because we need to scale up a few companies more because they're the only companies that can make these tests. It's because we have evaluated these tests all wrong and it has created a bottleneck in terms of which companies have actually been able to pass through the FDA gauntlet to get authorization. And to be clear, it, it, you can't really blame the FDA. They've been asked to do one thing, which is uh, authorize medical devices. And unfortunately, because the U.S. doesn't have a regulatory framework for public health tools, all of these powerful public health tools had to go through the FDA's bottleneck of medical devices, and most of them, not because they're inferior technologies, but because the companies didn't know how to set up their clinical trials to kind of skew the participants the right way, uh, have not been able to gain authorization. So what we need to do, there's actually a very simple solution. And that solution is for the president to use executive action to do something very simple, which is to state that the tools used for public health testing during this public health emergency will be designated as public health tools. It sounds very obvious. It's public health testing. They should be designated as public health tools. What that would do is it takes the onus off of the FDA because the FDA only has a, a myopic lens of evaluating a medical tool and it pl places the burden uh, on the CDC or the NIH to figure out how to authorize these appropriately uh, as public health tools, as transmission indicating tools, not tools to tell you that you have any RNA left in you from a previous infection, but the tool that tells you now in real time with actionable results that you are infectious, that helps contact tracing, helps all kinds of things. If the CDC takes it over because it gets out of the territory of the FDA, then they can use the right metrics to evaluate these tools. They can say, we just need the tools that will detect people who are infectious with a million viral copies instead of 10 viral copies. Uh, and we need tools. And we could also even look to Europe and say, what are our trusted uh, allies where we trust their public health infrastructure? And if they've had good experience for a number of months with certain tests, then immediately overnight, we could say, we are going to seed review and enable those companies to come into the United States as well. We could triple our, our uh, access to tests literally overnight if we could do this. And all it takes is a redesignation that's very sensible that public health tools are indeed public health tools and not medical devices. Well, Dr. Minna, I think if we just had that, uh, just what you've said there over the last minute or two, that would be an incredible public service. That's such a clear call to action. So thank you for that. Um, and, and maybe less clear, that's very clear, maybe less clear is what should we be doing in the nation's schools? The kids are back in school. 
Um, I understand more than a million children have been diagnosed with COVID in the past week. We've certainly seen younger children being sicker than we saw um, pre-Delta variant earlier in the pandemic. And yet school systems seem to be really struggling. Should they be testing all kids? Should they not be testing kids? How do we avoid hopefully the kind of extended quarantines and lockdowns that we had before? What's, what, your, what is your public health perspective on uh, testing for COVID in the schools, at least in areas where the pandemic is really running rampant? Uh, and is there a similar clear call to action that could be applied uh, nationally the way you've just uh, discussed in terms of making the test kits themselves more available? Yeah, this is one of the most important things I think that our society has to grapple with. We have had kids, I mean, there's nothing more important, I think, and obviously it's a personal opinion uh, in a society than making sure that we're giving children the foundation that they need to succeed. Taking a year away from peers, away from school, like we did last year is, uh, we don't have any idea actually what the damage is going to be for those students. Uh, and we need to stop spread in the schools. We need to stop quarantining students because we don't know who's infectious. And so there is absolutely uh, we have the tools to make this work. We have to recognize first and foremost what tools we're deploying today that don't work. And we have to come to terms and just admit that they're not working. The main one, in my opinion, is that a lot of schools have relied on PCR testing at, at all expense, at, at, at high expense, and even when they're taking three days to return. We have to recognize that a test that comes back three days later is just not stopping transmission, in particular with Delta. And uh, and so we keep putting a lot of energy into these PCR tests, largely because that's what has been available, because we haven't had the rapid tests available. Um, but if we can come to terms with the fact that this testing that we've been doing for the last year and a half just isn't the right kind of test for public health use, if I'm spreading virus right now, I don't want to go and walk around school for two days before I find out that I just spread to all of my neighbors. That allows Delta to spread. And that's why we're having trouble tackling the virus. Mm -hmm. So some of the best tools that we can deploy are to say, if you have an outbreak in your school or if you have cases identified, you can stop the outbreak very, very fast, deploy rapid tests, have them in people's homes. And if you have cases start to emerge in your school, have all of the students use a test each morning for five days, or all of the students that would otherwise be quarantining to keep kids in school without needing to uh, stay home just because Johnny in their classroom was found to be uh, infectious. We can actually keep kids in school and stop spread with these tools. They're, these tools are around 95% sensitive to detect people who are currently infectious and nearly 100% sensitive to detect the super spreaders, which are really the problems in a wow. school. Yeah, And so even though they're only 50% sensitive against any PCR test taken at any time during your infectious, your infection, if you're really interested in spread and stopping spread, these are 95 to 100%, depending on where you're on the course of your, uh, your infectiousness. And so we can deploy these at scale across schools and have kids use them at home before they go to school. So Johnny, Johnny in the classroom uh, is found to be infected Instead of telling all 25 of those children to go home for 10 days, that's an information problem. We asked them to go home. We closed down society last year purely because of an information problem. It was because we don't know, we can't see the virus. So we had to assume that exposed people are infectious people. But with rapid tests, we don't have to assume. We actually have a tool that solves this information problem. And if we deploy these properly, so have kids use them before they go to school, uh, a lot of people will say, well, how do you know that they actually used it? Can we trust them? Well, we actually have software and we have verification programs that enable it. Companies like eMed have worked with the CDC and Abbott to create platforms that allow you, just like we're talking here over the computer, allow a proctor to actually watch that. Yes, little Johnny did do his test today, verify that it was actually him doing it and his result was negative. And he gets a real laboratory pass and that says negative and the result goes to the public health authority. So it allows us to also keep the epidemiological data flowing. So we should really be using all of these different tools, the rapid tests, the verification platforms like EMED and Azova and a few others to really be able to 
bring this whole this whole system uh, to to sort of round out the system to keep kids in school, and frankly to stop outbreaks. We've been focusing on masks. I'm the, I'm not going to say we shouldn't mask, but we should also recognize that masks don't do a whole lot. Maybe twenty thirty percent reduction, maybe in a in a young kid uh, in a classroom because they're all pulling down their masks all the time, and this is a highly aerosolized virus. But a rapid test before school will be like a ninety five percent reduction in risk that you're walking and spreading. So it's a massively powerful tool. And so we just have to create the guidance. And I would urge the CDC too, to really start creating uh, guidance for very for each individual sector of society, whether it's schools, businesses, vaccinate or test, we have to really have a hard conversation about why that program was created by the president, because vaccines aren't stopping transmission. So we shouldn't be uh, causing, we shouldn't be calling a vaccine as sort of a transmission stopping uh, 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 tool. It's a hospitalization stopping tool. And so we just have to redefine what, what it is we're even trying to do here. And I think we absolutely can. Well, in a very divided uh, and polarized uh, country, I think there is bipartisan support to keep kids in school. And then you right. really laid out, I think, a very a clear and clarion call for the strategy that should be uh, uh, utilized. We're speaking today with Dr. Michael Mina, assistant professor at uh, epidemiology, immunology, and pathology at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Harvard Medical School. He's a member of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at Harvard and a lead researcher at the Human Immunomics Initiative. You know, uh, Dr. Mina, the recent drop off in COVID testing means that we're really not sure about how many breakthrough COVID tests are happening among the vaccinated, and you've just uh, uh, discussed that. But your team at Harvard uh, has been applying multiple disciplines to really develop a new surveillance system uh, for monitoring outbreaks, which you say will help us through this to better be prepared for future pandemics. How, how do we do a better job of data mining and surveillance? You've talked about one app that you've used, but what's the larger uh, strategy that goes all the way down to the local public health uh, organization uh, that they can utilize as well. Yeah, so there's a number of different ways, and I'm I'm really glad you're asking this because there are, there is a, a major difference between uh, public health surveillance and uh, public health mitigation strategies. Surveillance is to give the public health authorities an idea of what's going on so that they can then act, and that is absolutely crucial in a pandemic. And, but public health testing and screening is actually the action. And so there, there are two different things. And I think we have, uh, we have tools actually that we have not really deployed for pandemic uh, preparedness in the future that can actually allow us to discover new pandemics uh, before they really take off across the globe using the immune system, using new tools that allow us to profile uh, millions of uh, blood samples uh, very rapidly for all sorts of viruses to look for the immune signatures of a novel outbreak. So we could deploy, be deploying that. And that's something I call, what I would like to see developed is a global immune observatory to really tie laboratories across the globe together for true pandemic surveillance. But coming back closer to home, we have a lot of different options for this pandemic. Uh, for example, a lot of people think that we are just in testing purgatory if, if you know, somebody like me has my way. That's not actually what I want. I don't want us to just be testing forever. I want us to be testing strategically. And to do that, we need to have good surveillance systems at local levels. So we have a few different options. We can do what some schools have done, which is deploy sort of a fraction, testing a fraction of students once a week maybe 20% of students get tested once a week. It's just enough to be able to identify if there's an outbreak that's sort of emerging uh, that hasn't yet been detected. But we also have really, really powerful tools uh, in wastewater surveillance, which you can actually do quite easily uh, in many locations. And so you could say, as long as there's no massive cases going on in the community, we're going to just do passive wastewater surveillance for viral RNA. And if you start to detect viral RNA in the wastewater, then you know that there's cases and then you can turn back on the individual level testing. So we can, I, I call this sort of dynamic testing approaches. It doesn't just have to be that everyone tests themselves once a week, no matter what. 
can be when cases are low or absent, stop the testing when cases really start to pick up in, and you can identify those in any number of ways, including just really monitoring case counts in hospitals and local physicians offices. Then you can scale up the testing. And the only way to really do that, to have this sort of dynamic fluctuating amount of testing is to have people have these rapid tests at home because then you're distributing the effort of turning them on and off. You're not having to deal with a lot of big logistical chains of hiring nurses and firing nurses and all of this. You're just allowing the public to do what the public should be doing in a public health emergency, which is participate in public health, uh, even from, the, from their own homes. And so I would like to see us really have dynamic testing combined with localized surveillance programs that can enable schools to move forward in a very tolerable way, uh, at least for the next year while we're really grappling with this virus. Great. Well, Dr. Minna, that is uh, a really helpful public health perspective. And I wonder uh, if I could uh, turn our focus just for a minute uh, to some of the people uh, in the middle of this pandemic, and that's the healthcare workforce that's been at the heart of trying to respond and care for people. I think uh, 3,600 healthcare workers died from COVID last year. Uh, and like so much of what we've seen during this pandemic, uh, a disproportionate impact on people of color and people at the lower end of the uh, wage scale. And yet applications uh, for uh, people coming into healthcare, at least in medicine and nursing, where there's some good data uh, is up. It seems like there's been a, uh, a renewed call to service, uh, perhaps that people are experiencing uh, as they've uh, seen what's happening in the country and, and, and also uh, maybe get to experience just the satisfaction of being able to contribute in a meaningful way. But from where you sit uh, at Harvard and the Brigham and one of the epicenters of health professions training in the country, how are today's students and trainees looking at this world of health and healthcare and public health they're coming into? And how should we be thinking about maybe revising training and curriculum to meet the needs of our um, world going forward. I'd like to say post pandemic, but as you've just said, probably the pandemics to be dealt with in the future as well. How should we be preparing them maybe a little bit differently? Well, I, I think one of the major things is we should recognize where our deficiencies are um, in our medical training, but also in our public health training. We talk a lot about um, healthcare and health professionals here uh, in the midst of a pandemic, actually the health professionals, they are the boots on the ground for the sick people. Right. But dealing with a pandemic actually doesn't really require healthcare, interestingly enough. It requires engineering. It requires a lot of different sciences. Uh, actually, healthcare is almost like the end uh, of that line. It should be the last thing because if you're seeing somebody in a healthcare setting, that means we've failed up front with the public mm -hmm. health bit. So one of the things that I wish that we could do, because it's hard in, in high school and college for students to really get engaged with public health, uh, we should be building uh, graduate schools that are much more robust around public health that is almost equivalent to medical school. We have master's programs, um, but we don't really have a real profession of public health in the way that we have a, a com an industrial complex of medicine. Mm -hmm. And maybe and many, many physicians actually find themselves wanting to do public health. But ultimately, the way that we train students, we train nurses is so medicalized that it, it doesn't really tie together. Mm -hmm. uh, we tell people that they're that they understand public health, but actually they don't. Um, they read papers, but never actually practice it. So I would love to see, for example, medical education include rotations in public health agencies. Our physicians are some of the brightest people in this country and to lose them all, okay, not lose them, but, but to not funnel them mm -hmm. as many who would want to into these things where instead of you're dealing with one patient at a time, you're dealing with populations. I would love to see rotations really start pushing on that. And the CDC is actually has a little bit of that. There's actually residency programs uh, for public health, but they're pretty limited. Um, and so that's one thing. I do think we have to be really careful after this year while we're seeing a, a big increase in people wanting to go into um, professions that have been engaged with the pandemic, at the same time, we're seeing the people who have actually been engaged with the pandemic who are already professionals burning out at That's unprecedented right. rates. Right. And how we tackle that and bring them together 
I think is really going to be crucial to make sure that we are not um, that that we're not we're not setting students up to see mentors who are burning out and then choose to run away from it. Yeah. Um, we need to further support everyone involved, and that's healthcare, that's public health. This country, in particular, has a tremendous amount of money and resources, and I don't feel that we deploy it well enough in terms of how to actually help society at a, at a medical and a public health level. Uh, we could look at things like residency, like just what residents get paid, for example, has barely increased in years. And so that causes people to move away from things like public health because it doesn't pay very well and move towards neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why don't we pay people who go to the CDC, uh, you know, uh, uh, like we pay doctors? Like th this would make sense to me. We should be paying people commensurate with the work they're doing. And public health generally tends to be pretty darn secondary. You know, I hate to say that there's a silver lining to uh, this dark cloud uh, of the pandemic, but I'm, I, we've seen the, the uh, advance of the mRNA uh, vaccine uh, a couple of years uh, uh, earlier than people had predicted. We're seeing the RNA platform being used. What are you seeing out there that may be past the pandemic itself in terms of uh, the exploration that's going on with these new platforms in a pretty wide array of uh, clinical trials that are ongoing. Anything that uh, uh, gives hope to people who are facing other uh, types of chronic uh, conditions. Oh, absolutely. And I don't think it's bad at all to say you hate to say that there's a silver lining. Uh, it's the best thing we can we can hope for right now. And there are so many silver linings to this, um, to this absolute travesty that we've been dealing with. Uh, and you're hitting on one of the best and most important ones. The technology that is getting developed during this pandemic has literally been accelerated anywhere from two to 10 years right. uh, as a result of the need and the urgency. mRNA vaccines are an amazing advancement that have kind of been trickling out for a while. Moderna, uh, years ago, I was working uh, a bit with Moderna on their Zika vaccine, things like that. And now what we're seeing is the world has seen the power of these tools in a profound way. And these are going to be the tools as we move into the future that are going to enable us to, to harness the immune system to battle cancer, to harness the immune system to do so much that we just are trying to coerce it to do. We're at really a pretty early stage in our understanding of how to coerce this powerful system we all have inside of us, our immunity to fight things like cancer. And I believe very firmly that in the, in the next coming years, we're going to start seeing mRNA vaccines that are going to be personalized to your mm. cancer to actually help us fight it off. We're also going to see uh, moving away from the vaccine industry, but towards sort of testing and, and all this telehealth. Because people couldn't move around during the pandemic with lockdowns and all of that, we saw this massive acceleration of physicians and telehealth companies getting on board to say, look, it doesn't have to, you don't have to always spend a, a half of a day to go to a doctor just to talk with them for 30 minutes. You can actually do it from your home quite well. And this has really changed people's view of what is possible in healthcare. And now we're also seeing things like RADx with the NIH really accelerate the development of new technologies for diagnostics across the board. So I, I anticipate that over the coming years, the need to go into a doctor's office on a regular basis is going to change. We're gonna be talking to our doctors through telemedicine. We're gonna to have tools at our disposal to, uh, to either join into drug trials uh, from our home, uh, different trials, or just to be able to monitor ourselves on a, on a more regular basis and be able to really get preventative healthcare as a part of our society. I think that these are really the tools that are going to ultimately come out of everything we're seeing be developed for this pandemic. It's things that we can't even imagine what their use is going to be, but it is absolutely going to make, I think, the average American's interaction with what is currently an extraordinarily strained healthcare system uh, much more manageable over the over the coming decade. Well, that's a note of optimism for the future to end on, and some of that future is clearly already here, as you've said. We've been speaking today with Dr. Michael Minna, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology, Immunology, and Pathology at the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Minna, we wanna thank you for your commitment 
uh, throughout this pandemic to helping to educate the public, to advance the science of public health and interventions that will save lives. And thank you so much for joining us today on Conversations on Healthcare. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's That's a pleasure. Great.